Good. Well, thank you. Um, my presentation today is about the Mars Exploration Rovers, which are twin robotic laboratories that began operating, you're working on the feedback, eight years ago on Mars. Uh, one of which are, is still being used to explore the Martian surface today. And as, of course, most of you know, I'm sure, Curiosity, another rover, landed just a few weeks ago. And I'll have a few words to say about that at the end of my presentation. So my story is about how people relate to these robotic systems. The Mars Exploration Rover mission, also known as MER, or M-E-R, challenges how we usually think about the role of robots in space exploration. It provides a new way of understanding how computer tools and a proper social organization can be orchestrated to extend human capabilities. Now, for over 40 years, we have been exploring other planets and their moons with robotic spacecraft. Whether flying by beautiful blue Neptune, like Voyager in the 1970s, orbiting Saturn, like Cassini today, or roving Mars, like Mir, these spacecraft must be computer controlled because the communication time delay at the speed of light and their, their great distance makes it impractical to control them directly from Earth. Now we can joystick a rover on the Earth's moon. It takes about one and a half seconds for the signal to be received. But at the speed of light, Mars is at least five minutes away and sometimes 20 minutes. Radio time to Jupiter is on average about 45 minutes. And Saturn is twice that. When the New Horizons spacecraft reaches Pluto and its moon Charon in 2015, after a nine-year flight, it will take about four hours before we know whether the mission was a success. And it'll be long gone past Pluto by that time. Given the great distances, we can't go to these places in person anytime soon. So to carry out a scientific study, we must repeatedly reprogram and redirect the spacecraft, specifying where to go and how the various instruments are going to be used. Science teams working together for five or 10 years or more interpret the data that's returned and discuss with engineers what's interesting and what's possible to do next. So at its heart, the story of planetary exploration today is about the relation of people and robotic spacecraft. Machines that are actually comp complex laboratories capable of operating in extreme cold with little power, packaged to handle the vibrations of launch, and work for years without repair. Sending these scientific instruments throughout the solar system is one of the great successes of the computer age, and it will surely mark our place in history of science and exploration. But these missions also show that we understand how to design machines and organize people so everything fits. And that's my story today about the Mars Exploration Rovers. How the design of the spacecraft as you see Mer here, the organization of people, the software tools, and their work schedule makes it possible for scientists to work on Mars. Now in the scale of the universe, Mars is right next door. It's about nine months travel using conventional chemical rockets. Mars is about half the diameter of the Earth, but it lacks oceans. And so it has roughly the same surface area as the Earth. And that's a lot of landscape for us to explore. The climate is often colder than the Antarctic, with great extremes during the day. But on a summer afternoon on the Mars equator, you could survive wearing something like a lightweight scuba suit and a pressurized helmet. Now actually, a scuba suit might have been appropriate three or four billion years ago. We believed then that Mars was more like the Earth, wet and with a thicker atmosphere. One striking elevation map created from orbit shows the lower areas colored blue and suggests that large parts of the northern hemisphere might have been covered in seas 
And there is evidence for ancient shorelines. So what happened? Did life form on Mars? Why was its atmosphere lost? Are microorganisms living today below the surface? And if life formed there, did it form separately from Earth? Or are we related? These are the big questions that make many of us very excited about Mars. Now, as I've said, it's not practical to directly control a spacecraft on Mars because of the speed of a radio wave, which is the same as the speed of light. And it causes a time delay in seeing and affecting what is happening. But by acting indirectly through computer programs that monitor and control the rovers and their instruments throughout the workday, People have been working on Mars for over eight years. Two teams of scientists and engineers operating the twin rovers called Spirit and Opportunity have driven together over 25 miles of sand dunes in and out of a dozen craters and climbed hills hundreds of feet high to analyze the layers of deposits. And they've also stopped to admire the views and take photographs. The scientists have scraped the rock surfaces, microphotographed their texture, and analyzed their molecular composition. In February of 2004, a month after the landing, I had the privilege to observe mission operations at Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena for almost two weeks. The two rover teams had twin facilities on different floors of a given building at JPL, and they lived and worked according to the time zone of their rover. Because the Martian day is longer than Earth's, that means that they reported for work about 40 minutes later each day. If you were at the gate of JPL, you'd see people coming in 40 minutes later than they came in the day before. The main science meeting room was darkened so they could orient to what they called Mars local time. Each team had about 75 scientists and student researchers organized into what were called science theme groups, mineralogy and geochemistry, soils and rocks, geology, atmosphere. They were arranged at their own tables and they gave presentations interpreting what they were learning and what they'd like to do tomorrow on Mars. The long-term planning group sitting off to one side reviewed the overall mission engineering objectives, measures of how far they had traveled, the number of images they had taken, how the instruments had been used, and how these goals affected the plan for tomorrow. In the words of Steve Squires, the principal investigator of the Murr mission, this has been the first overland expedition on another planet. Applying the rover's tools at chosen spots along the Martian landscape, we've learned how water has affected the chemistry of soils and rocks. And we found places in the, in the past that were similar to where life thrives on Earth. Home Plate, for example, an area behind the Columbia Hills is about 100 meters across. It might be a remnant of hot springs like those we find at Yellowstone National Park. So this is how planetary field science proceeds, by recognizing minerals, formations, and processes that are familiar to what we understand on our home planet. The success of what's called comparative planetology on Mars is partly why it's such an exciting place to study. We're on another planet, but it looks and feels a bit like home. Now, just as the MERS scientists make analogies with Earth, my study of field science on Mars started by comparing it to how field science is done on Earth. Since the late 1990s, I had been joining Mars scientists on an expedition in the Canadian Arctic, a nearly lifeless landscape called Houghton Crater on Devon Island. Now, the scientists chose this place because it is Mars-like allowing them to understand how and where life exists in extreme environments. And the expedition itself reveals how people might live and work on Mars, 
if they were studying the landscape there. And that's of interest to mission planners. So on Devon Island, I followed the scientists in the field to understand how they explored. It was a big